Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, we look forward to what God is going to bring to us today. Father, we just pray for your, your hand to guide us through this day, uh, Lord, that you would uh, give everyone uh, their part in this, this event today, Lord. Uh, Father, please bless our worship team as they come up here to bring forth uh, holy sounds that only you could place in them. Uh, Lord, I pray for Bill to be uh, able to hear clearly from you as he drives in from Athens right now uh, the words you would have him speak and the uh, message you would have him bring, Lord. Give us all ears to hear. Give us uh, that mirror to look and examine ourselves, Lord. Father, we do thank you for the uh, blessing of being able to come together uh, as we are today uh, and so many visitors with an upcoming uh, Passover in a couple of days, Lord, uh, where we can truly feel uh, your power and your presence and, and listen to the reasons again why you brought us out of bondage. Father, show us how to uh, walk in the freedom that you blessed us with in Yeshua's name. Abba Father, I believe that you're speaking this morning, that your heart is on those of, with a broken heart. And I just want to lift my voice to you, Abba Father, and pray. I ask you, Abba Father, those in the midst of us here, those on our live, st live stream, especially those in this, tre this treasure box up here, many are prodigals. They don't realize it because they have broken hearts and you are the healer of the broken hearts so father i pray as we worship you today if it be your will that you would send out your ministering angels of healing with the they have little vials of healing oil and that you would pour it into the hearts of those that have broken hearts your word says that you are near to those with a broken heart and of crushed spirit. And I pray, Abba Father, that that oil would seep in and start healing those places that need healing. And our prodigals would start realizing that it's not that they're angry, it's that they have a broken heart and they need to be healed. So Abba Father, I pray that you would right now, even, even as we speak, but even as we worship today, Abba Father, I pray to pour out that oil so that when you call, these prodigals will be ready to come home. Thank you, Abba Father, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Yes, it is our Father's desire and His heart for uh, it is our Father's heart for His people to come home with to Him. Amen. And I'm grateful that He called me and He called all of us home to be with Him. But we all have loved ones that uh, aren't home yet. But yet. But in our hearts they are. Amen. We believe and we believe and we stand that those lives and those children that belong to him, the father loves them more than we love them. And I know he's calling them home and they will be home and they are home in my heart. And I thank him for it. And we all thank him for it. Amen. It is a time to rejoice. Amen. Because he has saved us. He has delivered us. He has brought us out of Egypt. Now there's a little Egypt inside of every single one of us. And we got to work on that. And that's what his word does. The watering of the word cleanses us. And they work out our salvation. Sorry, I don't mean to preach. Preach it. But it it's, it's, a, it's a keyboard over there. You know. It's, it's, yeah. Can I bring out the hanky right here? Sorry. Sorry. Everybody take a deep breath. I'm just kidding. It's good. But it is good. It's a time to rejoice because we're going to celebrate Passover, what the Father has done through Messiah to save us and bring us to this beautiful place. And like Bob said, how many visitors do we have here? Wow. Praise the Father. Thank you for being here. Thank you for making that journey. And I know you will be blessed because we're all blessed because the Father's with us. Let us sing. 
Watchman. As they blow the shofars, I just believe that those people in that treasure back box will come alive, will revive, will awaken to the call of the Father. Just like He woke us up. Shabbat 
Shabbat, 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 Shalom. Hine ima tovu manayim, Shevet achim gam yakai. Hine ima tovu manayim, Shevet achim gam Yahai, in a matu, in a matu, la 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 y'all turn around on my face it came to a standstill yeah it came to a standstill you're barely crawling but i guess brandy have to speed it up so you can really move <laughs>
boys out in this ball right here. I can't imagine what the kingdom is going to be like. Wow. Be a little louder than this, I think. Yeah. I'm getting some goosebumps.
doesn't matter what it looks like. We believe it because He said it and His word is true and it will stand forever. You said
for the souls of your people that you fight father to heal father all iniquity father and sin father you heal our bodies and father we thank you for healing bodies right now the father's healing someone's been having issues you've had issues with your stomach I don't know what kind of issues that they are but the father's healing you from that he's a good God and someone's been going through some issues with your nerves I don't know if it's the nerves actual nerves or if you've been nervous about certain things the father says he is with you he'll never leave you nor forsake you he's the God who heals and he's the God of Shalom thank you father and there's someone you've been facing an obstacle you've been facing an obstacle and there's like a wall that the enemies put against you the father said he has torn it down. Praise him and thank him for it. He has torn it down. Just walk by faith. As you begin to walk towards that wall, it will crumble, he says. Believe. Just believe for it. Now there's something else that this is different. Abba wants to fill his people with his presence. 
we've, you've talked about so much about the gifts of the Spirit. He wants you to experience the gift of His Spirit. By faith, lift your hands up. And Father, I ask, Father, that you fill your people with your Spirit. Your Holy Spirit, Father, you promised when you would left, you told your disciples to stay and you would fill them. The disciples went out and people were filled with your Spirit. Father, fill your people with your Spirit so that may we, we may walk in obedience to you, Father. Everything that you have for us, Father, fill us, Papa. Have your way with all of us, Father. Use us, Father, for your glory. For you are, Father, and you have established this place, Jacob's tent, for a purpose, Father. All of us, Father, have a function to do here. Oh, Father, but we need your Spirit to be able to function in that purpose, Father. Don't hold back and help us not to be afraid, Father. Hold back. Father, by faith, Father, we believe, Father, that you will and you do desire to fill us with your presence, to do your work. There's many of you that he's going to begin to establish things in your life and speak to you about certain things in your life. He's going to ask you to do certain things. They're not going to make sense to your head, but it's a calling. It is a gifting. It is something that he wants you to do. Don't be afraid. Just obey. It might be something small, it might be something grand, but it is his will. He established this house for his purposes and his will will be done in Yeshua's name. It's not my life to live. It's not my song to sing. All I have is His for all eternity. It's not my righteousness. It's not my faithfulness. All I have is His for all eternity. And we will crown Him, crown Him King of glory. Crown Him, crown Him Lord.
you for this day. We thank you for what you are doing. We thank you for what you've done. We believe, Father, everything you say in your word. We trust you in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Shabbat shalom. While everybody's standing, let's continue to worship in reciting the Bishamru. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. One of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Yeshua answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second like it is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Gentlemen. Shema. Israel, Adonai, Eloheinu, Adonai, Echad. Ladies. Shema, Israel. Everyone now. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Blessed be his name and his glorious kingdom forever. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Stands a whole law. Love your neighbor, love your God. They are hard. While we get the hoopas ready, shake hands, say hello. I think it's safe to hug next at this point.
Alrighty, so if we can get all of our itty bitties gathered under the hoopah. Let's get all of our sons and daughters gathered, please. If you're at home, if your kids are nearby, your grandchildren, won't you gather them up close to you? I'd like to remind everybody who's out in the live stream, we do have our treasure box, and so when you send your pictures, we put those names and we put those pictures in the treasure box, and so they'll be under the hoopah when we, when we pray this blessing as well. So now, if I could get everyone to kind of turn your attention toward our children. Let's suspend the conversations for just a moment, please. And if you can and will stand, extend your hands toward these treasures, and let's pray this blessing over them. May the Lord protect and defend you. May he always shield you from shame. And may you come to be in Israel a shining name. May you be like Ruth and like David. May Strengthen them, O oh Lord, and keep them from the stranger's ways. May God bless you and grant you long life. And may sir and pray over our children please sir lord lord we come to you in prayer today and we ask you to guard over our children and we thank you for all the blessings that you've provided us with and their children is the one of the biggest so just pray that you provide us the wisdom to act as we should to lead the children and the passing down of the your wisdom through generations. I just ask you to protect them and guide them daily from this current world we live in. I just ask that you protect them from the stuff that's unseen that they can't see, but we can, and that you can. You show us the hazards. You just protect us from what we know is here we can't see, but we can see you. Help us keep our focus on you in these days. As we pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You can all return to your seats now. Thank you. And as soon as you can do that, um, that would be great. We have, uh, I need to share something with you. Pretty important here in just a moment. So if you could go ahead and take your seat just as quickly as you can. Get situated. I know we've got some visitors with us today, and uh, I think we have enough chairs, but if you've got empty seats on the inside of the aisle, to help us out and kind of squeeze in there real quick. Hoskins, Mr. Hoskins, are you nearby? Can you come here, please, sir, real quick?
and a hush fell over the crowd. <laughs> All right, just going to give you a couple of more minutes here to get situated. Um, actually, I think what I'm going to do, Alan, will you hand that to me, please? Yes, please. And uh, I'm going to give Brandon the microphone. I had a microphone, but I'll use this one. I'm just going to make it short and sweet. Um, this is my fiance down here, Miss Melanie Bacco. <laughs> Come here, bitch. Want to say hi? Just say hi. Hello. <laughs> we just got engaged this past Thursday, so just wanted to let the family know. So this is Mel. So she's she's part of the family. So we just want to let you guys know. We love her. She's a, she's a wonderful young lady. We're we're happy to have her in our family. Do you want to say anything real quick? Just God is so good, so good. All right. So, and just for the record, um, she is Brielle approved. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, yes, very much, most definitely. So, so congratulations to Brandon and Mel. So, and with that, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Father, thank you for this day that you've given us this very special time of year. We thank you, Father, for all your goodness to us. As we prepare to go to your word, to learn, to glean from it, to, to help us in our walk, to draw closer to you or in, our, in our efforts to draw closer to you, Father, I pray that, first of all, that if there's anything in our hearts and lives that would stand between us, that you would forgive us, that you would remove those things, that bring it to our attention so that we can acknowledge it, turn from it, repent of it if need be. Father, help us today to set aside all of the things of this past week, good and bad, to set aside all of the concerns about next week so that we can completely focus upon you at this point in time to come into your rest, into this Shabbat. And as we prepare for these set-apart times that you have ordained from the beginning, Father, we pray that we will truly begin to prepare our hearts for what you wish to do in the days ahead. These things we pray and ask in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, two things real quick. Allison, come here real quick. Just hold this microphone. I'm not going to ask you to do anything other than just hold the microphone. <laughs> About to hot to death up here. So, so apparently we've officially entered the season where we need to crank it down on Friday night so we can be ready for Saturday morning, all right? All righty, so today uh, our tour portion is called Metzora. So once again, we get to talk about icky things. Uh, <laughs> um, I, like I was sharing last week, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, maybe I shouldn't say, it's not one of my favorite parts of the Bible, honestly, um, because of all the things that it's dealing with. But nonetheless, um, it's part of the word of the Lord, and we're going to share some things from it and see if we can glean some important things that we need to, to hear this day and time. But anyway, this Shabbat today is the Shabbat before Passover, of course, and in, uh, our Jewish friends refer to it as Shabbat Hagadol, which is the great Shabbat. And in their view, it's, um, it's important, and I won't go into all those reasons, but from my point of view, I think it's very important that we take this time, uh, the Shabbat that we, we experience every week. You know, we know it's a respite. It's a time to cease and desist from all our labors and these kinds of things. But um, it's also probably, at least for me, it's going to be a good day for me to catch my breath 
and start really thinking about, I probably need to reflect on some things and examine some things before I go sit at the Lord's table. So that's, that's kind of how I'm approaching it because we need to come to the Lord's table clean and without the world's contamination all over us. So it just so happens that this week's tour portion talks about contamination and then those who are cleansed from that contamination. So we'll begin Leviticus chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, This shall be the law of the Metzorah, or the leper, for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall examine him. And indeed, if the Zorah, or if the leprosy is, is healed in the Metzorah, or in the leper, then the priest shall command to take for him who is to be cleansed two, uh, two living and clean birds, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. And then it goes on from there to describe all the procedures that this person would have to, uh, along with the priest, uh, go through. So coupled with last week's Torah portion, which was called Tazria, this portion is again going to address laws of purification pertaining to those things that emanate from the body, Things like the zorat, the leprosy, other bodily functions that we really won't get into the details of that. You can read it for yourself. But the point being is that in the last Torah portion, it emphasized the separation that had to occur when somebody was in a state of uncleanness as it related to the sanctuary specifically. Because they were unclean, the sanctuary could not be defiled, so they had to be set outside the camp until they were cleansed, until it was pronounced that they were clean. And so this Torah portion is going to describe what happened when that person was cleansed. Um, if, you were, if you were here in the Midrash last week, we talked a little bit about the fact that there is a belief, there is a tradition that in all of Israel's history, up until the time of the Messiah anyway, that in all of Israel's history, there had not been a record of an Israeli man being cleansed and then offering the gifts that Moses prescribed. We have Miriam, who was a woman, and we have Naaman the Syrian. But there was no other record of anybody up until we get to the time of the Messiah. So then there was this belief that because this had never happened, because God has given us this command that we've never actually had to perform, it must mean that in the time of the Messiah, we'll do this. And so then when we see Messiah healing those who were afflicted with the Zorat and then having, <clears throat> having them go and offer the gift, it was a sign that the Messiah had come. In fact, let's read in Matthew chapter uh, 8, beginning of verse 1. When he had come down from the mountain... Great multitudes followed him. And behold, a metzorah, a leper, came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And then Yeshua put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his zarat, his leprosy, was cleansed. And Yeshua said to him, See that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded, as a testimony to them. And that phrasing there as a testimony to them kind of underscores the, the notion that maybe this was a sign of, of the Messiah's arrival. Go and do these things and that's gonna speak volumes to them as, as, test, as a testimony to them. So if we understand the messianic, uh, the messianic expectations of the religious community, at that time regarding the cleansing of Omet Sarah, in other words, up until this time it did not happen, the fact that he told this man to go and offer the gift that Moses prescribes in the Torah, as we just read some of it, it, um, it would refute the idea that he didn't want anybody to know that he was Messiah. Because there are people who read this when he says, tell no one, that somehow or another he just wanted to kind of keep it a secret that he was the Messiah. Not true. He was just, six, he was just screaming, I'm the Messiah, in a very Hebraic way. But he's following protocol as well. Go to the priests, all right? They're the ones that are going to have to announce and pronounce and determine that you are clean. Now, it's obvious that the Messiah has healed him. He's cleansed. But nonetheless, he tells them to do exactly what the Torah says to do. And so then after this man 
has gone and presented himself and he's went through the procedure for his cleansing, he would be permitted to come back into the community. And that's really what this Torah portion, I think anyway, at the beginning is emphasizing where before he was separated from the community, now he's going to be welcomed back into the community because he is cleansed. And again, I think it's very important that Yeshua, even though he cleansed this man, um, he, wanted, he wanted this man to follow the protocol that we see in the Torah so that his cleanness or his cleanness will be validated and will be verified. So then him coming back into the community, even though he's been cleansed of his Zorat, coming back into the community was not instantaneous because he had to go and present himself to the priests and he didn't go into the temple to present himself to the priest. He was outside the camp, so to speak, and the priest went out to him to verify all these things. And if you read in the Torah portion, it wasn't just that day, was it? There were several days and then there were gifts, all these different things. It wasn't instantaneous. There had to be proof of his cleansing. And the Messiah is advocating that. It was something he wanted to make sure happened. He's healed, but I want the priest to validate it. I want them to verify it according to the word of the Lord. And let's don't miss this point. The joy that that man who had once before been outside of the community has now been brought back into the community. That must have been a good feeling, right? But it wasn't instant, was it? He had to go through the process. By the way, this is not the last time that Yeshua would heal the Metzorah in Luke chapter 17, verse 11. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And then as he entered a certain village, there met him 10 men who were lepers, who were afflicted with the Zorat and who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Yeshua, master, have mercy on me. And so when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. He just spoke the word. But again, go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Yeshua answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner. And he said to him, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. So there's probably some other things about this narrative that we could go into. Um, it would seem that nine of them in all their excitement forgot to say thank you. Uh, that's not really what I'm gonna emphasize today, but I think it's important for us to remember to stop and say thank you. Right? It's important when we do something for someone, it's important to us for them to acknowledge that something kind has been done uh, on their behalf, right? And it just really helps us when someone will acknowledge that and say, thank you. One of my pet peeves, I'm getting off track just a little bit, but one of my pet peeves is to be somewhere and I see somebody, a woman coming out when she's got stuff in her arms, you know, or uh, it could be a man too, and I open the door for them. And they, zoop. <laughs> they don't even bat an eye, you know, they don't, nothing, nod ahead, you know, and then that's when I have to remember. <laughs> I've got to go in above and beyond what the world does because what I want to do is, well, anyhow, <laughs> you understand. Anybody with me on this? Okay. So it means something to us when somebody will stop and acknowledge, hey, you did something nice. You did something kind. Thank you. I appreciate that. And so apparently with the Messiah, it was kind of the same way. Only one returned, took the time out to say thank you. And because of that, he says, now because your faith, of your faith, now you're going to be well. You're going to be whole, which to me infers there's a lot more going on here. And... The thank you came from the dreaded Samaritan. You know, the one who's got everything wrong. The one who does everything wrong on the wrong mountain. They don't understand the Torah at all. They're doing these feasts and these doing these holidays. And yet, 
They're the ones who took the time out to say thank you. Again, there's probably a lot more to be explored in this passage, but here's my point. Yeshua is the only one authorized to cleanse someone from this affliction. The Father gave him the power and the authority to cleanse those from this affliction. And so then that puts him in kind of a confrontation, more or less, with all of the religious people concerning his Messiahship. But let's, let's get back to the main issue. And that is in the last portion, it emphasized the Zarat and the consequential separation that came from the community. And this portion is describing what happens when and if someone was cleansed from that Zarat. In other words, as awful as Zorat was, I mean, again, skin stuff, icky, ooh, heebie-jeebies, all those kinds of things. And the exclusion from the community would probably be the worst part of it, frankly. But as awful as it was, it was not necessarily a death sentence. Because with Yeshua, there's always hope for the outcast. There's always hope for that one who's cut off from the community. Usually, not every year, but it's very common for this Torah portion of Metzorah to be coupled with the previous one, Tazuriah, to have this double portion. I think it's more common uh, that way than it is this. But this year, they're divided up. And this year, Metzorah is the Torah portion just before we go into Pesach. And I take that to be important. It's almost as if the Creator is just wanting to emphasize something for us as we approach Passover. So then, let's keep that in mind because this Torah portion, not only does it talk about the procedures uh, connected to the cleansing of Omet Sarah, but it, dis it discuss uh, discusses other issues as well, unpleasant things, and yet everyday things that causes uncleanness in regard to the sanctuary. So there are some very common things, things that we have no control over sometimes, that nonetheless cause uncleanness in regards to the sanctuary and most importantly, the presence, the one who's in the sanctuary. And as you read these things, and I'm assuming that you did, and if you did not, you need to go back and read them. But as you're reading all of this, and you're going, ooh, and eh, and all this, here's one thing that is made very clear to me. The contact someone else has, if, well, when we make contact with someone who is in a state of uncleanness, we become unclean. Read it. If someone was in a state of uncleanness and you came in contact with them, it potentially made you unclean. Now this, again, this is all within the context of the sanctuary, but the sanctuary is about approaching God. And remember what we said last week. God's not cruel, he's not harsh, he's not mean, he's holy. And because he's holy, he cannot allow, he cannot permit his holiness to be compromised with my uncleanness. He makes allowances, he makes provisions, he has installed a particular protocol and that's all summed up in the Messiah. Nevertheless, he cannot allow his holiness to be contaminated by my uncleanness. So, if I want to approach him, I need to keep in mind that if I come in contact with someone who is unclean, and I'm going to go so far as to say I know they're unclean, that that has the potential to make me unclean. And I think this is very important for us to keep in mind because Monday night, we're going to all sit down at the Lord's table. Right? We're going to come into a time where he says he is going to meet with us. And so we should not regard this as just something else on the calendar that we do. This is an appointed time. And he has summoned us to come to his table. So again, we need to be very careful about what we come in contact with. Because if it's unclean, it has the potential to make us unclean. We need to be very careful about our associations. That is, if we want to be a holy people. Now, Bill, I wish you'd get off this topic. Well, talk to him. All right? I wish you would talk about something else. Why is it making you feel uncomfortable? 
Because if it is, good. It's supposed to make us feel uncomfortable. Because if we're feeling a little bit uncomfortable, maybe that means we need to examine ourselves. All right? We need to be careful about who and what we come in contact with. And particularly as we are about to sit down at the Lord's table. And some will say, well, that sounds like it's narcissistic or elitist. Talk to God. He's the one who's holy. And he being holy calls upon his people to be what? Holy. Which means what? Set apart. Set apart from what? From all that other stuff, Right? To set apart from those who are in a state of uncleanness. And so there's a lot more to being a holy people than we're in tzitzit. There's a whole lot more to being a holy people than just abstaining from pig. Right? All right. So now, we need to be careful about who we rub elbows with. Lest their uncleanness affects us. We need to be careful about what we let in our eyes and ears and all these things. Right? It, we need to be careful about that. So with that in mind, Leviticus 14, verse 33. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, when you have come into the land of Canaan, which I give you as a possession, and I put the leprous plague, the Zorat, in a house in the land of your possession, and he who owns the house comes and tells the priest saying, hey, it seems to me that there's some plague in the house. Then the priest shall command that the house be emptied. Before the priest goes in to examine the plague, that all that is in the house may not be made unclean. And afterward, the priest shall go in to examine the house, and he shall examine the plague. So the first thing that jumped out at me about this is it says that God puts this zarat in the house. He causes it to be manifest. That's interesting to me. So now remember, if Zorat is a physical manifestation of a spiritual issue, and if the Lord puts a Zorat in the house, it's to me, it's as if he's saying, there's something amiss in this house. And it needs to be addressed, and it needs to be corrected. And so at that point, the house is emptied, lest everything in it become unclean. Now, uh, I think the question came up last week in the Midrash, is this mildew? I don't know. It could be, maybe. I'm not going to be dogmatic about it, because it doesn't call it mildew, it calls it zarat. <laughs> It, that's what it calls, so I'm going to kind of stick with that. But again, it makes me think, because he says, if I put a zarat in the house, it makes me wonder, is there something going on in that house that he says, this needs attention, and I'm going to bring it, I'm going to make it manifest, so that you'll be forced to do something with it. But here, it's appearing in the stones and the plaster of the house. So I was thinking about this, you know, if it were going to do, and again, I'm not saying it was, but if it were, it doesn't say that it's just on the stones. It's in. So I was wondering about that, and I looked it up just to make sure I know what I'm talking about. But, yeah, stones are porous. They're natural material, and because they're porous, things can grow in them. And the things that are growing in them will eventually be manifest on the outside of them, just like the person, the Metzorah, who's afflicted with the Zorah. So he goes in and he examines the house and he sees something that uh, indicates there might be a problem here. He has the house shut up for seven days. And then the priest comes back and he goes in to examine the house again. And it says, if the plague is still present and it's spreading, here's what you do. Verse 40. Then the priest shall command that they take away the stones in which is the plague. And they shall cast them, the stones, into an unclean place outside the city. And he shall cause the house to be scraped inside all around. And the dust that they scrape off, they shall pour out in an unclean place outside the city. Then they shall, then they shall take other stones and put them in the place of those stones. And he shall take other mortar and plaster the house. So we're going to scrape off all the plaster and we're going to take out the stones, remove them from the house. Boy, better not be real, real important stones holding everything up, right? 
but we're gonna take out the stones in which this, whatever it is, this zarat is growing and apparently causing other stones to be affected by it. Those things are gonna have to be taken out and then taken to an unclean place and then those stones are replaced. So I want you to consider this in light of some passages of scripture here. Ephesians chapter two. I'm gonna read a lot of Bible today. Ephesians, yeah. It's about time, Bill. Shut up and read, yeah, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Ephesians chapter two, verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Messiah Yeshua himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together, take note of that, being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. So basically what he's saying here is that the people of God constitute a house. We're his house. You know, there's a lot of uh, emphasis placed on the temple that was in Jerusalem uh, that was destroyed, both temples that were destroyed. There's a lot of emphasis on the fact that there is going to be a temple that is going to be real. But, and I, I'm not going to get into all those things today. But this tells me that you and I as his people collectively constitute his house. Do you see that as well? All right, I'm just making certain. So we constitute his house. We're being fitted together, it says. We're growing into a holy temple in the Lord so that his presence and his spirit can dwell within us as a people. So as God's people, we are part of his house. We're being fitted together that he might dwell among us. And he, Messiah, he's the cornerstone. He's the one upon whom everything rests. So if he's the cornerstone and we're being fitted together to make up a house, would that not infer that we are stones? Right? Not bricks, stones. So here's what Peter has to say about it. First Peter chapter two, verse four. And coming to him, that is to Yeshua, as to a living stone, which has been rejected by people, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Yeshua the Messiah. That word acceptable is pretty important because it would infer what? That we might think that we can offer things that are unacceptable. So it's really important that we see ourselves in this light, that we are to be living stones. We're being fitted together into this spiritual house. Same thing that Paul was talking about. Messiah is the cornerstone. We've got all these who've come before us and who have, through their journey, given us an example of what to do and sometimes what not to do. But if we are to be a priesthood, then we have to do things his way follow his protocol, and acknowledge that what we are called to do is the holy service. It's set apart. And we cannot allow, well, he will not allow his holiness to be contaminated with my uncleanness, right? So let's let that kind of filter down. If he will not allow, allow his holiness to be contaminated with my uncleanness, and he makes me clean, should I allow my cleanness now to be contaminated with your uncleanness? Especially if we are stones that constitute his house. If we are stones that are being fitted together to make up his house. All right, but it's inevitable sometimes, I guess, it, because we have people. Uh, and I'm not talking about us necessarily or specifically, but just the body at large. We have people. And so there will be those occasions, apparently, according to the Torah portion, when Zarat will appear. And so somebody has to say, this looks like this could be Zarat. I need to go to somebody in authority and have them come check it out and see what they say. And so then the priest goes, as we read, to see what's going on here. 
And if there's a problem, then it needs to be examined. It needs to be investigated. And that zarat, if it appears, what is it? It is a manifestation that there's an issue. There's something growing inside that needs to be addressed. And so in the Torah portion, the plaster is scraped off. The word means scraped. It means planed. Here's the way I look at it. The plaster's the skin of that wall. Yeah, you're the flesh. We'll just go ahead and use that word. And so what are you going to do? You're going to scrape it off. There is a passage where David basically says to God, scour me. Scour me so that I can be pure. Scrape out, scour, get all of that yucky stuff out of me. Same idea comes to mind here. You're going to scrape all of this off. You're going to plane it off. The skin of the wall is going to be removed. And then what's going to happen to it? It's going to be taken to an unclean place, right? Then the infected stones are removed and they're cast into an unclean place. The Hebrew word that is uh, describing this infection that these stones have, I think uh, the translation I read from said the plague, but it's nun gimel ayin naga. And it means something that has touched something else it shouldn't have. Interesting. Consequently, it is stricken. It is infected. So then, stones that touched other infected stones are marked with the plague. That's, uh, that's what's going on in the Torah portion. And so then the reason that these infected stones are removed and then replaced with others is what? What do you think the reason would be? According to what we read in the Torah portion, what would be the reason for removing these stones, replacing them with other stones, taking the stricken stones outside and putting them in an unclean place and making sure they're replaced with something that's clean? What would the objective be? So I don't have to tear the house down. That's the whole idea. It would really be a shame to have to go in and raise the house and tear it down. By the way, what happened to that second temple? Not one stone upon another. The first temple, here's what Jeremiah says of it in Lamentations. The stones are scattered on every street corner. It would seem to me that God does not hold us to a standard that he himself doesn't adhere to. Because apparently there were times when his house had an issue and it couldn't get fixed. And so what did he do? <laughs> so the reason that you remove the stones and replace them with others is to hopefully avoid having to tear down the entire house. But then the Torah portion also describes for us that if the issue cannot be remedied, if an active leprosy is in the house, the priest has to say the house is unclean. And then what happens? It's eliminated. The recurring issue means that the house has to be torn down. Now, I understand that this is talking about things pertaining to the sanctuary a long time ago. But there are reasons that God tells us these things that pertain to us today. And the fact that if there is a zarat in the house and you take measures to remedy that, and then it comes back and it starts to spread, the, if the house has to be torn down, that should be a concern to all of us. It should be a concern to me for my house. It should be a concern to every head of the house is here, this listening out there, and it should be a concern for every congregation that calls themselves and professes to be followers of the Messiah. If there are issues that there are attempts to remedy and yet it keeps coming back, that should be a cause of concern for all of us. You see, the issue is if the uncleanness is serious enough God's, first of all, he's the one who calls for that separation. But if it's serious enough, there are other ramifications. Leviticus 15, verse 31. 
Thus, you shall separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness when they defile my sanctuary that is among them. I'll go back to something we said earlier. He's holy. He's not cruel. He's not mean. He's not harsh. He's not impatient. He's, he's not, you know, sh you know short-tempered. That doesn't describe our God. He's long-suffering. He's compassionate. He's merciful. He's all of these things. He forgives, right? But he's holy. And he cannot and he will not allow his holiness to be contaminated with my uncleanness. He makes provision. He makes a, a, a there is a, um, there's a path to reconciliation and restoration. But I can't skirt around that. Because he will not allow his holiness to be contaminated by my uncleanness. And so he says, basically here in verse 31 of chapter 15. Now, I've told you all these things. So you'll, you can identify what uncleanness looks like. And you need to make sure that if you come in contact with that, understand that you've been made unclean. You need to make provision for that. Because I'm not going to let your uncleanness contaminate my holiness. And you need to let everybody know this because it's pretty serious lest they die in their uncleanness when they defile my sanctuary that is among them. In other words, he's saying, I'm not going to let you continue to walk into my presence in this unclean state. He's going to hold every one of us accountable. According to him, the issue is that uncleanness, unclean, cleanness defiles his house. To continue to be unclean in his house results in his death. That's not Bill's words. You read it in the Torah portion. Right? I'm just the mailman. Right? So that brings me to this point in relation to Pesach. Just a couple of days away. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to read a good bit of scripture. And I'm going to let Paul preach for a little while. Is that all right? He's a much better preacher than I am. We're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and sexual immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, namely, that someone has his father's wife. It's so bad that not even the pagans do this. You have become arrogant. And have not mourned instead, so that the one who has done this deed would be removed from your midst, like that stone that has to be removed from the house. For I, on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this, as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Yeshua, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Yeshua, I have, decided to, uh, I have decided to turn such a person over to Satan for the destruction of this body so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Somehow or another, their arrogance led to being, I don't know, willing to be tolerant of certain things. So he goes on, do you not know that a little hummus, a little leaven, leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Messiah, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let's celebrate the feast not with the old leaven, not with the old ways, not with the old way of thinking, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not at all mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the greedy and swindlers or with idolaters for then you would have for then you would have to leave the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is a sexually immoral person or a greedy person, or an idolater, or is verbally abusive, or habitually drunk, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a person. For what business of mine is it to judge outsiders? 
Do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outsiders, who are outside, God judges. Remove the evil person from among yourselves. So I wanted to read this because Paul is connecting the idea of making certain, and this goes to us as individuals, it goes to us as a family, it goes to us as a congregation, it applies to the body, it, it touches every one of us. It applies to each and every one of us, starting here. That he's saying, look, if you've got a stone that's infected with this stuff, you need to remove it. Because you don't, it's going to affect others. Right? Okay? So we have it on pretty good authority that when you see these kinds of situations, there are things that you should do. Now, granted, it might be growing inside that stone for a long time before you ever see it. But when God does allow it to be manifest, then he expects you to take action. And so Paul is saying here, look, you cannot have things that are going on in your midst. But he also says you need to be careful about which stones you're rubbing up against. Okay? Do you see that? Three people? Anybody else? Anybody else see it? Okay. All right. Let's go on into 1 Corinthians a little bit more over to chapter 11, verse 23. Paul's preaching. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Yeshua, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy way shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a person must examine himself. A person must examine himself. And in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For the one who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not properly recognize the body. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number are asleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So I think the point here is obvious. As we're approaching Pesach, as we're approaching the Feast of Unleavened Bread, um, again, this shouldn't be just something else we do this is just one of the things that we've got to check off, you know, in the calendar uh, because that's who we are and that's what we do. Um, if that's our attitude, then I, this is Bill's opinion, if, if we're kind of nonchalant about it, kind of flippant about it, <laughs> we run the risk of partaking of the Lord's Supper unworthily. That's just my opinion, but it's a strong one. And so we should not allow this just to become another thing. It is a set-apart time that requires reflection on our part. We should examine ourselves. Just like that priest going in to examine that house to see, is this a right or no? We need to examine ourselves. Everybody in this room, everybody who's watching out there, we need to really take a hard look at ourselves and maybe be willing to be honest with ourselves about some things that we've kind of let go. We've kind of pushed it aside. Life got in the way. We didn't have to. Yeah, I understand how all that happens. But we need to examine ourselves. We need to examine our households. What are we allowing in? What are we allowing? And, you know, I've, I've got some things that I'm, I'm, I need to work on. I'll be the first one to admit it. Now, I know that y'all have got it all figured out, but I need to work on some things, right? 
And here is why it's so important, because as we said again and again and again, what was okay yesterday may not be okay today. And what's okay today may not be okay tomorrow. That is, if we are striving to draw closer to him, who is this all-consuming fire, he is a holy God and he expects holiness from us. And some of us, some of us have been at this long enough now that there, there's just time to deal with some things. Right? We need to examine ourselves. We need to remove the leaven from our house. Right? We've been working on that, right? Yeah. Removing all the chametz from our house. So imagine working really, really hard, being very diligent to remove all the chametz from your house, and then you let somebody walk in with chametz. So if we are going to remove the chametz from our house, from our lives, we shouldn't just allow somebody else to bring it right back in. Would kind of defeat the purpose, wouldn't it? Before the first Passover, did the Lord not set a distinction between his people and Egypt? He, he caused a separation between his people and between Egypt. Yes, because he was showing himself to be mighty, but I want to suggest to you also because it was demonstrating that when you go inside that house and you put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and the lintels of your home, and I see that blood, it's a sign between you and me. You should be in your house doing what I've instructed you to do. And everybody else outside, I, well, I know who they are, right? And so he, he already began to set a division between Israel and between Egypt as it led up to Pesach. So again, if we go to the trouble to remove the leaven from our house, and I'm not just talking about breadcrumbs now. If we go to the trouble, and we should, to remove the leaven from our house, we shouldn't turn right around and allow somebody else to bring leaven back in it. Makes sense to me. If he has cleansed us from our Zorat, should I continue to dwell with the Metzorah? Did you understand what I just asked you? If I have been cleansed of my Zorah, and anybody in here, everybody in here, if you are born again, in a matter of speaking, you have been cleansed from Zorah. Right? Agreed? And so when the Zorah was cleansed, and he went through the process, and he was announced to be clean, did he go back and hang out with all the other people who were afflicted with Zorah? Or did he come, on, come into the community of faith? So if we have been cleansed of our Zorat, we should not be hanging out with the Metzorah, the one who is still afflicted. We need to be living stones, not those stones that are marked for an unclean place. And it's very, very possible, folks, that in our hesitation to hurt somebody's feelings, I want to show them love. In our hesitation to offend someone, let's not allow their zarat to in infect us. We need to go to the Lord's table clean, pure, blameless, forgiven, cleansed of all unrighteousness, and not unworthily. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... Mm. You remember when Yeshua was taken before Caiaphas and, you know, that he was, you know, so-called trial and um, was crucified. Some of the religious leaders went to Pilate and said, hey, uh, we need to talk to you about something, but we can't come into your house lest we be defiled, because Passover was coming. Now, I'm not advocating and endorsing these people who were trying to kill the Messiah as great spiritual leaders, but the point I'm trying to make is that they were so serious about the whole contamination thing leading into Passover, they said to the governor of that, uh, the region, we can't come into your house. Do you understand what I'm trying to get across here? As we go into Passover, we don't need to just be 
kind of flippant about it. We don't want to sit at the Lord's table unworthily. And for whatever reason, the Lord has just kind of put this on my heart very, very strongly this year. We need to do today what needs to be done. And that includes we need to judge ourselves rightly for the sake of the body. We really need to examine ourselves. And if we do not know, if we do not do what we know to be right in our lives and in our households, the Lord will. The Lord will do what must be done. So my message this morning is going to be a little shorter than most. And the applause broke out. Anyway. <laughs> I don't typically read from the Haftarah, but I'm going to do, to do that today. And, and actually, there's a very special Haftarah for today since it's Shabbat HaGadol. And it's taken from Malachi chapter 3. And it begins in verse 4, but I'm going to start reading in verse 6. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Now, let's just stop and meditate on that for just a second. He's the same yesterday kind of like we were reading in the Torah portion. He hasn't changed his mind about all of those things, right? He's the same today, yesterday, and for, he just don't change, which kind of flies in the face of how we are. We're all about change, you know? He's constant. He's consistent. He doesn't change. He doesn't compromise. He's merciful. He's compassionate, but he does not com compromise his holiness and his standards. So if anybody's going to change, it needs to be me and conform to his way. I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, in what way shall we return? And he says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing, that there will not be enough room to receive it. Let me pause. I know he's talking about tithes and offerings, if you will allow me to take the principle that, that is conveyed here and suggest that there are other ways that he wants us to try him to see if he will not do what he said he would do. Basically, he's saying, do as I've instructed, do what is right according to my word, and if you do that, even though it's gonna cost you, but if you do that, you will see that I'll be faithful to do what I said I was gonna do. That's basically what he's saying here. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Here's what popped in my head in connection to Pesach. You take that blood of that male lamb of the first year, you slaughter it on the 14th day between the evenings, and you take that hyssop branch and put that blood upon the doorposts and the lintels of your home, and you go in to eat the matzah and the bitter herbs and the Pesach, I will pass over you. And in passing over you, I will not allow the destroyer to come into your home. That's what he said, right? He's saying more or less the same thing. If you'll do what I'm asking you to do, and it might be a hard thing that I'm asking you to do, and it's going to cost you your tithes, your offerings, whatever the issue may be. But if you'll do what I'm asking you to do, I'm going to pour out a blessing, and I will rebuke the destroyer. You won't have to rebuke the devil. I'll rebuke the devil. And when he rebukes him, the devil listens, right? He may not pay attention to many of us, but if the Lord rebukes him, he's going to pay attention to that. And he will not be able to destroy the fruit of your ground. If you'll allow me, he's not going to destroy that that you... Well. Those things that we hold precious 
I'm not going to let him destroy them. And all nations will call you blessed. For you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said, it is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the proud blessed for those who do wickedness are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. What he's saying is when things don't go our way and we get frustrated with God and say, look at what you're letting all those people do. What, is, what good is it to do what you've told me to do? That's what they were saying. And in this way, you've spoken harshly to me, he says. To the point that they call arrogant and proud people blessed. The wicked are raised up. But look what it says. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. Apparently there was a few, there was a remnant that got together and said, hey, let's, let's encourage one another. Let's strengthen one another here. And the Lord listened and he heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my segula, my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. In other words, he's responding to their complaint. You let the, uh, the, the proud do all of these things and, and they go free and they tempt you and you don't do anything. And he says, look, to those who fear me, those who serve me. There's this book of remembrance. You remember what that book of remembrance is all about? There are these things that we're told to do that sometimes we don't even understand why we're supposed to do them. Maybe they don't even make sense to us. Why do we do this? Why do we, why do we blow silver trumpets every new moon? Why do we do this? Why do we do that? What's it really going to pay off? When well, there's a book of remembrance. And he says, there's coming a day when all of these things, your alms, he said to Cornelius, have come up, your prayers and your alms have come up before the Lord as a memorial. All of these things that we've been doing again and again and again and again and trying to be faithful in spite of all these conflicting emotions we may have going on within us. He says there comes a day, he opens up that book of remembrance and he remembers, which means he moves on behalf, he acts on behalf of those who fear him and who serve him. And when I get done, you will not have to figure out who's wicked and who's righteous. You'll know. You'll be able to discern. Just like... When all those things begin to happen in Egypt, he set a distinction between Israel and between Egypt. It goes on into chapter 4. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. And all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. That's not what we're going to emphasize here. But the Lord does those things. But here's what we are going to emphasize. To you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses. Remember the Torah of Moses. Now, remember you know what? He says, I've got a book of remembrance. And those who fear me and who serve me, there comes a day I'm going to act on your behalf. Guess what he's saying now? But if you fear me, remember the Torah of Moses. Which is to say what? Act on behalf of what is written. Act on behalf of what I've told you and instructed you. Don't, don't just talk about it. Take action. Do those things that I've told you to do, the hard things that I've told you to do. Remember the Torah of Moses, my servant, which I commanded in Mechorah for all Israel. With all the statutes and the judgments and all those things that you said, what's the point? Do them. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet 
before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And what is his mission? To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And so, in this closing thought, you remember in 1 Kings, I think it's chapter 18, is it chapter 18? He goes up, he summons all of Israel to come to Mount Carmel. Remember that? Carmel, the vineyard of God. And who's there? There's the prophets of Baal. There's the prophets of Eshtaroth. And there's a, the people are assembled there. And what, what have the people been doing? They've been trying to serve God and trying to serve Belim and Eshtaroth and all. It's all kind of mixed up. Kind of hard to distinguish the righteous from the wicked at that point. Kind of like Laodicea, you know, cold and hot mixed together. But here's Elijah in the midst of all that. And he's, he's like, look, here's what we're going to do. If Baal is God, then go serve Baal. But if the Lord is God, then serve the Lord. And it would suggest do things his way. So let's decide this once and for all. Who are we going to serve? And so you know the story, the prophets of Baal, you know, they got their altar and they got their sacrifices and they're cutting themselves and calling out to Baal and all these kinds of things. And while this is going on through the day, Elijah's over there off to the side taunting them. You need to, you need to cry out louder. He went on vacation. Oh, oh, he might be in the bathroom. That's what he said. He's taunting them. But now, when they get through, the pressure's on. Because you see, if he says, I want you to dig a, a ditch around that altar, fill it up with water, pour water over the altar till the ditch is filled up with water, and the God who answers by fire, he's the one. Pressure's on. But here's what he did. He took stones that had been cast away by others and he put them back in their proper place. That's what he did. So his is not so much about the confrontation, but it's about the restoration. Let me tell you something. If we truly want restoration, there's gonna have to be a confrontation. And the confrontation boils down to this. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. Right? The Lord will rebuke who he needs to rebuke, but the Lord is looking for who is going to obey me no matter what. Amen? But, but if there is going to be this restoration, there has to be this demonstration on our part that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen? Amen? So as we prepare for Pesach, and I want you to hear me on this. I'm not, I really don't want this to come across as somebody's up here preaching to you. This is something I need to do. But not just me. Everybody in my household, we need to examine ourselves. Everybody in your household, starting with the head of the house, needs to examine themselves. And as a congregation, we need to examine ourselves and we need to be, be prepared to remove those things that are an, an affliction, a plague, those things that could threaten the very existence of your house, my house, this house. And we have to be willing to do what he has told us to do. We have to. Because if we don't, well, what does that say? Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor do so in vain, right? It would be a crying shame for this house to be leveled. Because if the house gets leveled, the people scatter, right? So what must we do? We've got to be very diligent about these things. There's a reason these Torah portions, I'm convinced anyway, there's a reason these Torah portions fall the way they do. Because that's the way the Lord speaks to us. So I know he's spoken to me about some things, personal things, things that pertain to my, you know, my household, things that I need to do, things I am, with his help, going to do. 
But when I go to his table, I want to know that I know that I know that there is nothing between me and my master, that he welcomes me to his table, and I'm not going to partake of that unworthily. Amen? Beth, if you want to come up here. And I want, um, I want us to be certain to pray for people who are sick uh, and who want to join us, that, that all those things, that they're healed and God touches their bodies and their lives so, so that we can go into this season, you know, healthy and whole, Okay. We do have some prayer requests that have come in this morning, even uh, during praise and worship. And I, I don't always look at my phone during that time, but I happen to see them, so I'll get to those today. But um, lately, the Father has been awakening me at around 4.30 in the morning. And for several hours, which kind of makes for an interesting day when you're trying to get a lot of things done. Um, so this morning, of course, it happened again. And I'm like, Father, I really would love to sleep the whole night through and be so fresh for today. You know, it's your day. It's a day of rest. We've already entered into that. So I asked him, why? Why, why are you waking me today? Um, and it was to pray for the prodigals specifically. And like Bill is saying, you know, I'm starting to feel like, okay, everybody's going to say, oh, this again? Are we still on that? My answer is, do we still have prodigals out there? Is it ever time to stop praying for them and considering them? I understand there are times that other things are a greater focus, but that should always be great in our hearts and mind. So I obeyed and I prayed, and this is what he told me as I was praying. Don't just pray for the prodigals. Pray for their children, those born and those not yet conceived. Because what they're doing right now is affecting their children and their children to come and the generations. And that's not fair to those children, those that aren't even born yet, the ones who are born. It affects the generations. It has an effect right now. So pray for them for the sake of the generations. Um, so I did. And so I was so glad when this morning during praise and worship, and in the prayer that was brought forth, you know, with, when Bob and Marlene were up here, that that was the focus and it was a confirmation. Because like I said, I've been thinking, Father, do I bring this up again? Because it's, we just keep harping on this. But again, they're still out there. Um, so just imagine, you remember when you were a child and you knew you did something that your parents had taught you not to do. They told you, they'd warned you against. You knew, like Bill said, when he was playing in, was it Hammond, Louisiana, and the father spoke to him, you know you don't belong here. His mother had raised him better than that. He knew better. He knew better than what he was doing. So when you're a kid and you get caught and you're like, mm, I know, it's, it's coming. I know somebody knows that I've been doing what I've been doing. And then when it finally comes that reckoning time, isn't it a relief? You remember that as a kid when it's your, as you're relieved when it's over with and you didn't die and nobody said, I hate your guts, get out. I'm never talking to you again, hopefully. And you know, if you, you had parents who love you or whoever was that authority over you. They instructed you and they embraced you back in and they were happy that you confessed. And what a great feeling that was. I remember it. I know it's like gonna surprise a lot of you, but I'm not perfect. I did do things as a child and um, I was that kid. And I just remember that feeling of relief and of feeling cleansed. And sometimes it was a spanking and that didn't feel good. And I'm gonna tell you, that was not the fun part of that situation. But the after part of being cleansed and set back in my proper place in the family felt so good. And so what happens from the time we're children till the time we become young adults, older adults, really old adults, that we quit 
think, we, we don't remember that feeling anymore of relief and being reinstated and how wonderful that feels. So we're gonna pray for our prodigals to crave that feeling so that they run to that repentance because I don't know about y'all, but when a prodigal comes back in, it's not shaking the finger in their face. Well, let me just tell you all the things that you did that are wrong. No, if they're truly repentant, it's gonna be a celebration, not a condemnation. So anyway, I'll move on from that. Um, when I was reading the portion, and it all does kind of tie together to what we were just talking about, the commentary suggests that um, God afflicts the property first and uh, you know, the house and the garments. Now this is the commentary, so take it for what it's worth, okay? But I just thought it was interesting that he afflicts the property first and in so doing, the whole house is emptied for all to see what's inside. It's exposed. Everything that's inside, imagine if you've ever been to Israel and you see those you know, small homes that they lived in that out in their very small front yard, which is right next to their neighbor's front yard, like it's hard to tell which is which, all their stuff is spilling over into the neighbor's yard. So those things that they said, I don't have that in my house. I'm not doing that. And then you have to suddenly empty the whole thing into the yard so that the priest can come. Exposure. So my prayer is always, Father, show me first, please, so that I can take care of it privately with you one-on-one -on -one, so that I don't have to go through that and so that my neighbors don't have to see this. How sad for them that they have to endure this alongside their neighbors. It's not fun for anybody. So then if there's still no repentance, then the person is physically afflicted. Um, one of the commentaries, I just wanted to read this small portion of it, was based on um, Leviticus 14, 9. And it was talking about the shaving that has to be done. And it talked about the parts specifically that were so important. The head represents the haughtiness since he, the person committing the offense, considered himself better and more worthy of respect than those he maligned. So the head is shaved. The beard frames the mouth, which spoke the gossip and slander. The eyebrows represent the base trait of jealousy, which literally is narrowness of the eyes. If you're jealous of somebody, you're going, I don't like what you're getting to do, and I'm not. I don't like what you have, and I don't. You know, just think of that, that little narrow slitted eye which motivated him to destroy the reputation of others. All of that is so sad. And so that is a warning to us because we're not so pure that we don't fall back into some of that from time to time. Starting right here, all of us. None of us are exempt from it. And that's what Bill was just talking about, what the Father was bringing out through the scripture in his message is I don't, I don't want to have to be shaved like that because of my sin. I want to take the time right now to get it right with him, to do the cleansing 101 privately with him because he is that good that he will meet you that way. You don't have to go to a big football stadium filled with people and, and just do a, you know, a crowd cleansing. He is so amazing. He will do it with you one-on-one -on -one in your closet at your house if you will just yield to him. And that is my prayer. Father, don't let us have to be shaved. Let us cleanse our houses and let us yield to you and invite you to cleanse our hearts. Let him cleanse our hearts. And as Bill said, let us do things your way, your way, no matter what, whether it feels like it or looks like it, like we think it should. Let us seek him and do it his way, no matter what the fallout is. No matter how many people say they don't like you, no matter how many people say they're, well, I can't have anything to do with you anymore, do it his way. That's my prayer. So I'll, we'll include that in the prayer in a minute, but I do have some people that I want to bring. But before I go to the prayer requests I want to bring, um, I have an amazing 
praise report. I just have been waiting since I got it to share with you. Um, many of you know Jose and Maria Jorkin who have joined us for Sukkot uh, for several years. Uh, they had to miss one year, um, but they have pretty consistently been with us and they usually have a whole group of people who join them uh, as well. Well, we've been praying for them and the situation with their grandson. Uh, I don't know all of the back details, and uh, that's not as important as what the Father has done. So we have been praying for them to be able to have their grandson with them, and they thought it would be, well, we know naturally we're the grandparents. This is where he belongs. If he can't be with his parents, that just seems like a no-brainer. I mean, it did to me too. Well, it wasn't. And it was difficult, and they ran through into some horrendous obstacles that looked like it was that <laughs> unbreakable, but Abba broke the unbreakable, and their grandson is with them now. <laughs> so they're hoping to be able to join us again for Sukkot this year, and I know that they would love to share the testimony with you, and hopefully by the time that time of year rolls around, there'll be even more, and hopefully their grandson will be able to be with them. Um, it, can, it can lead into a permanent situation, and that's what we're praying for. So keep the Jorkins in prayer. Keep Jasper, their grandson, in prayer. Um, I just, I was so excited to share that. Another reconciliation has happened. So the Father's still doing it. He's still doing it. Amen. Give him a praise. So our help doesn't come from man. And what they say is impossible. He says, watch this. So move the immovable, break the unbreakable. He did it. He's still doing it now. So we're going to apply that to these people that I'm about to mention for prayer. Um, some I'll have information, others I don't. And some I just won't say because I didn't get permission to go into details. Please pray for uh, Deb and Stephen Gold. If you know them, you'll know why. Um, let's continue to pray for Sister Kathy. Let's pray for um, some right here in the house that aren't with us today. Let's pray for Tom and Sungwan Matunas. Remember them in prayer. We, uh, Tom can't always be here and Sungwan comes, you know, when she can. And it's been a long time since Tom, Tom has been able to join us. Um, and we miss her when she can't come and we, we're sad that Tom can't join us. Pray for them. Just lift them up. That they would be encouraged and strengthened and that uh, the Father would just work for them and uh, through their situations. The same for Adrian and Debbie Peterson. We pray for continued healing for Adrian and strength for both of them. If you're taking care of a loved one who's been through a surgery, you know what that's like. It's double duty for you and as much as you love them, it can absolutely wear you out. So just pray for them. Um, and then our dear friend Dennis Sarton, Bill used to go and speak to his congregation and uh, we prayed for him and members of their congregation through the years. He sent me some requests. Uh, his grandson, uh, Latham Centony, I hope I said that correctly. Celso, where are you? The stomach issue was for his grandson. And so let's pray that we'll get the praise report. Amen. Give the Father a praise. <laughs> so thank you for being obedient, brother. Um, but let's pray for Latham that uh, they will be able to, to very soon come back and give us the praise report that says exactly what the Father has done, that he was 100% healed and it started today. Um, let's pray for Pam Bird, who fell and broke an orbital socket of her eye. Yeah, that's, uh, bless her heart. Uh, for quick healing and no permanent uh, damage to the eye, also um, for just as, you know, a comfortable healing process as possible. Also for uh, Chad, and a Joe Chad, who had injuries from a motorcycle crash, uh, several broken bones, and, and any other issues that are there. And then uh, this one, uh, a lot of you probably follow this uh, musician and heard that Mandisa passed away. Um, yeah, so if you will, pray for her loved ones. Um, 
Any time that someone in a notable position dies, uh, suddenly everybody claims to be their tight friend to garner, you know, attention for themselves. And I can't imagine what it would be like for someone like this um, and her family, you know, not knowing, well, who actually really knew her and who's just, you know, an opportunist. So it's hard enough to go through the grief in these situations like that. So pray for her loved ones. Uh, I don't, I don't know what happened, um, but let's just continue to lift that family up in prayer. Um, and then, as Bill said, all of the ones who are wanting to be with us for Passover this year, let's pray for everyone to stay well. Let's pray for those who are dealing with a physical situation right now, that the Father would touch them and heal them. And there would be no hindrances of any kind for them coming to be with him. And that most importantly, we don't disqualify ourselves from being with him this Passover because we don't take the time to cleanse our house and our hearts. Amen. So if you will stand with me. And as I pray, please don't just listen to me. I know that you know so many others who need prayer. And I'm just going to ask you to lift them up. And if one of these in particular that we talked about struck your heart, definitely lift them up and remember our treasure box. Abba, I do thank you for how mighty you are and that you do move the immovable and you do break the unbreakable. And for the things that you've done for the Jorkin family, Father, it gives us all hope to see what you do for one, we know you can do for the rest of us. And so, Father, we're not giving up on the prodigals. We're not giving up on that difficult situation. We're not giving up on that wall that's been put before us. If we're walking with you, there's a reason you allowed it to happen, and it will only be for our good. But today, you told us for someone, maybe multiple someones, You've shattered that wall. And I thank you for that, Father. And I look forward to the praise reports because of it. Father, I pray that for our prodigals, that you will not only move in their hearts, Father, but that you will cover and protect their children, the ones who are already born, who are being affected by the decisions the parents are making, and those that are yet to be born, Father. Put your covering over them. Protect them, Father. Pass over them. And keep them safe, unharmed. No negative effects from the decisions that are being made that are not in their best interest by those who should be considering them. Father, for all of those that we mentioned today for healing, for those who need encouragement, for anyone who is traveling to be with us for Passover, I just pray that you would just be there in the midst, Father. Let your healing powers be obvious this day and let the praise reports just pour out, Father, that we would not forget to thank you, Father, but that our praise reports would be more numerous than our requests to you. I thank you for that, Father. We trust you. Help us to cleanse our houses and our hearts, Father. Let us yield to you that we would let you do it your way no matter what. We thank you in Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. If you have little ones in the nursery, uh, if you wanna go ahead and go upstairs and, and get them so that uh, you can come back down and rejoin us for the blessing and for the kiddish. And for those of you who have prepared and have a willing heart, we want to invite you to bring your offering into the Lord. Uh, for everyone who's at home that wants to participate in this act of worship, we want to invite you to do that at this time as well.
the first. Okay. While we're waiting on everyone to get back from the nursery with our littlest treasures, um, we want to recognize our first time visitors. So if that's you and you haven't gone to get a little one from the nursery, raise your hand nice and high, our first time visitors so we can see you. A lot over here, a lot over here, some over here. That's great. We're so glad that you're here today and uh, we will have a brief reception out in the foyer immediately after the service. So um, Brandon and, and Bill and I and some of the other staff and some of our tribe captains will try to be out there. So if the rest of the family, if you'll just give us time to go out and greet them so that they can go on to lunch, then we'll be available later. We're, we're starting to eat with whichever tribe is over here um, during the uh, Oneg. So we can talk to you after that. But we would love to uh, meet our first time visitors, shake your hands, uh, give you a hug if you're okay with that. And we won't keep you long. And with that, the rest of our family who far outnumber this crowded room are behind camera number two with Faithful Miss Laurie. Very good. We're so glad that you joined us today. Uh, we're thankful that you're a part of the family and we get to meet so many of you and Hopefully we'll get to meet a lot of you at Passover. And um, on that note, I know some of you are here early because of Passover and some of you are staying after Passover. So our staff is so thankful for our streamers that we decided not to cancel Wednesday night's service. Now our office will be closed Wednesday, but we are not canceling Wednesday night's service. We're gonna be here so we can meet those of you who stayed over just to be in service with us Wednesday night. So. We love you. We hope we get to meet a lot of you at the Seder and then the service on Tuesday and then Wednesday night here. So with that, I think if we have the okay. Okay, she's giving us a thumbs up. We are ready for the blessing. is having their lunch over here today what tribe any tribe 
Ephraim, okay. Ephraim, we'll meet you over here by the windows. The tables will be set up over there for this tribe today. Um, a lot of our staff has decided they're gonna be eating with you, so there'll be an extra table for staff members. So we'll be dispersed among you over there. Um, remember, we have tables in the other room over here if you're not able, and, and this is mostly for our um, first time visitors. I know the rest of you know this. Have I lost everybody's attention already? corner is right over here and that Bob and Marlene have designated members of the prayer team to be over there praying and some people may be making a life-changing decision so please be respectful as you go out the doors and when we leave today um, and I think with that are we ready for Kiddush okay, okay. so I've asked the Grahams to lead us in Kiddush and how say this morning and they had a full 60-second mm, warning. <laughs> but anyway, he's going to need the, the confidence monitor to have the... There we go. All right. You know, you. All right. All right. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam King of the universe who creates the fruit of the vine and forgiving us, Yeshua the Messiah, who said, I am the vine and ye are the branches. Lahayim. like to remind everybody that the most important bread that we're ever going to receive is the bread that came from heaven. So we presume that everybody is here. You know the Father through the Messiah, but at the same time, if there is anyone who does not, today is the day of salvation. And as Beth said, there'll be a team over here that'll be happy to pray with you about that or any other uh, issue that you'd like to pray about. And if you're online, you're watching this now, you're not born again, there are people who will pray with you right there. No, if you're watching this later, uh, even months, you know, know that the Father can speak to you in, in that moment. So we just want to make sure that everybody has realizes just how important it is to have that relationship, to be born again. You must be born again. And Monday night, we're going to be really amplifying that fact. Amen? So, with that, Amen. It's, um, today is the day of salvation and it can be the day that you begin the path to reconciliation. So, don't forget that. Today is just as good a day for that as any other day. So, why not just get started today and begin to feel that relief. So, um, I want to go ahead and remind our streamers that today Sadly for you, there won't be a midrash because we are having the quiver promotions and we don't air that. So yeah, they're excited. Our, our quiver's over here sharing. <laughs> but uh, we're sorry we won't see you at 3.30 today. But we love you and we hope to see you at Passover. Um, we'll be streaming all of that. And if you're here locally by then, in the house on Wednesday night. So we love you and we say goodbye to you now. 
The rest of you.